This video focuses on explaining a recursive definition, also sometimes called an inductive definition. Now in this course, we've actually already used a recursive definition using our syntax to come up with new well-formed formulas. I'm gonna start this video explaining how that worked, and that's gonna explain what a recursive definition is. Then I'll give you some other examples of recursive definitions, and then I'll show you how you can use this tool in different ways. Now we're working on our language of PL, propositional logic, and we were specifically talking about well-formed formulas. Remember, well-formed formulas are just strings of symbols that are part of our language, right? They're acceptable in our language. We've already listed out a set of symbols that are, are gonna be used in this language. Now we gotta figure out how do we list out all the possible well-formed formulas? First, let's review those symbols that we have. We have our basic propositions, A, B, C, all the way through Z. We also said that there's like A sub one, A sub two, right? You can subscript these guys and then you can have an infinite number of these, but just to make matters simple, let's just worry about A through Z. Pretend that's all we've got. So we have our basic propositions, A through Z. We also have our connectives and we wanna be able to use these connectives with previously existing well-formed formulas to form new well-formed formulas. We also have our parentheses, and these are really the only punctuation that we're going to use. Not super important right now, but we'll, we'll take account of it as we go along. Recursive definitions always start with some base clause. Also, I've heard it called an initial rule. What does this do? This identifies or possibly generates a set of things that have the property that you're interested in. For us, we are interested in well-formed formulas. And I know that I wanna count those basic propositions as well-formed formulas. I wanna be able to say that A by itself is a well-formed formula. So let's make this initial rule. Any basic proposition is a well-formed formula. So now I've identified a set of things that have this property, well-formed formula, that I'm interested in. The next thing that recursive definitions always have is a recursive clause, also sometimes called a successor rule. Now I know that I wanna be able to add connectives to previously existing well-formed formulas to form new ones. How is that gonna go? Well, right now, the only well-formed formulas I have are those you know, A through Z, those basic propositions. Our, our first rule, our initial rule, uh, that covered our, our first 26 well-formed formulas. But I'm gonna need a rule that tells me how to use these connectives with previously existing well-formed formulas to generate new ones. So let's figure out how to do that by looking at some of our connectives. The first connective that's really different from the rest of them is the negation. The negation, remember, was a one-place connective, and what that meant was you attach it only to one well-formed formula, and that will produce you a new well-formed formula. So here's our rule. Here's what we're gonna do with this one. We're gonna say, whenever you wanna attach this, this, negative, this negation, to a well-formed formula, let's put it first, and then we'll write the well-formed formula you're attaching it to right after that. So I have A as a well-formed formula. That would mean that not A is also a well-formed formula. B is a well-formed formula, not B would be a well-formed formula. And in general, we can write a rule. Uh, let's say that if alpha is a well-formed formula, then not alpha is also a well-formed formula. And notice the alpha is, is a, remember we said it was a meta variable. If you don't remember what that is, see the previous video, I'm totally explain it there. But alpha will be able to stand for any possible well-formed formula that we already have, right? A, B, C, all the way through Z. Those are the only ones we have so far. And alpha can be any one of those. That's the one place connective. Now let's talk about some of the two place connectives. And really we only need to talk about one and the rest of them are kind of similar. So we'll talk about the and. Remember, and is a two-place connective, which means that you attach it to two well-formed formulas, two well-formed formulas you already have, and that will generate a new well-formed formula. Now, again, there's a number of ways that we could do this. We could write the and symbol and then write both of our well-formed formulas right next to it. Uh, we could put the and symbol on top of them. We could do all kinds of stuff. But let's do this. We'll make our rule that first you put the parentheses on the outside, and then you write one of the well-formed formulas, then you write the and symbol, and then you write the other well-formed formulas, all of those inside of the parentheses. So again, we know that A is a well-formed formula. That would mean parentheses A and A is also a well-formed formula. A and B are both separately well-formed formulas. So if we put our parentheses on the outside and said A and B, that would be a well-formed formula. And in general, here's what we'll say. If alpha is a well-formed formula and beta is a well-formed formula, then we will say that parentheses on the outside, alpha, and symbol, beta, 
is also a well-formed formula. And notice what we're saying here. We're saying that alpha and beta can stand for any well-formed formulas. Any well-formed formulas at all, that means that they don't have to be different well-formed formulas. So for example, I know that A is a well-formed formula, then A could be alpha and beta. Alpha is A, beta is A, that would mean that A and A is a well-formed formula by this rule. And we can write rules just like that for the rest of them. You know, if alpha and beta are both well-formed formulas individually, then parentheses alpha or beta is also a well-formed formula. If alpha and beta are well-formed formulas, then parentheses alpha arrow beta or parentheses alpha double arrow beta. And using these rules and using these well-formed formulas that we already have, right, A through Z, we can come up with a whole new set of well-formed formulas. I think like some 2,730, I can't remember exactly what the number was, but you could generate a whole new set of well-formed formulas just using these rules and our previous well-formed formulas. But wait a second, we just generated a new set of well-formed formulas, right? And alpha and beta can stand for any well-formed formula. So that means after this step is done, the, the recursive clause, right, the successor rule, I can actually take that stuff that I just generated and plug it back into this rule. So if alpha is a well-formed formula, not alpha is a well-formed formula, I just said that A and A is a well-formed formula, right? Parentheses A and A. That would mean parentheses A and A could stand in there for alpha, right? So that would mean that not A and A is also a well-formed formula. So now I've applied the successor rule two times. And notice I can apply it a third time. I could take that stuff that I just made, not A and A, and I could plug it into one of my other rules. I could say, uh, I know that A is a, a well-formed formula. I know that not A and A is a well-formed formula. So let's put that in the or. A or not A and A is also a well-formed formula. And this is the whole point of a recursive clause. We create rules that begin with a set of items or things that we've already identified or generated that have the property that we're interested in, in this case, well-formed formula. And using that set of stuff in our rules in this, in this clause, we identify or generate new items that have that property that we're interested in. These items, these things, are then added to the set of stuff that we've already identified. And they can then be replugged into the rules of this clause, and this can go on indefinitely. So our recursive clause, our successor rule here is gonna be that if alpha and beta are well-formed formulas, then so are not alpha, alpha and beta, alpha or beta, alpha arrow beta, alpha double arrow beta. And of course, I didn't tell you about the parentheses on the outside because that just gets tedious. Now, in those first two clauses, we use those rules to identify only things that are well-formed formulas. But does that mean that we identify all possible things that are well-formed formulas as well using those rules? Could it be that we use these rules we figure out every possible well-formed formula with these rules, but there are also other well-formed formulas that we don't capture with these rules. That will be the point of our final clause, number three. Nothing else is a well-formed formula. And just that easy, we cut off all possibilities outside of the ones that we've already made. So there you go, that's what a recursive definition is. You start off with a base clause, it identifies or generates a, a set of things that have the property you're interested in. You set up a recursive clause, this uses previous things that you've identified or generated with those properties you want, and it identifies or generates new things with that property. And then you can take those things and replug them in. And then it doesn't always have to be the case, but you can also put in a final clause which just says that, you know, nothing else counts. So last time in the last video, I asked you to do 2.5.1 exercises problem two. Let's go ahead and go over your answers. And uh, these will be more examples of recursive definitions. And if you didn't do it already, that's okay. You probably figured out from here. Question one says, to make a recursive definition that identifies the set of all odd numbers. So how are we gonna do that? Well, remember with the recursive definition, we start off with a base clause, a set of things that we are gonna identify or generate using some one initial rule that has that property that we're looking for. And the property we're looking for is odd, being an odd number. And the most obvious odd number is the number one. I really could, uh, uh, for this one, I could start off really anywhere in any odd number, but we'll start off with the number one. Now we go into a recursive clause, which will use what we've already identified here and we'll build all other possible uh, things with that property by continuously applying it to the thing that we just got. So 
if one is an odd number, right, what's the next odd? The next odd number is three, and I know that's two away from one. So, and then I think about, you know, from three is five, and then seven. Those are all two away from, from the previous one. So, one thing I know is at least going one way, every time you add two, you get a new odd number. And then when I think about the negatives, every time you subtract two, the same thing happens, right? You get a new negative number. So here will be our recursive clause. If x is odd, then so is x plus two and x minus two. Now we'll plug in that, that first, the number one, right? Which is this, really our set had only one thing in there, but the number one was odd. We plug it in for x, x is odd, right? That's so one is odd. And then one plus two and one minus two are also odd. So, you know, three and negative one. And now I know that three is odd, right? I got the negative one is odd. So if three is odd, then three plus two and three minus two are odd, right? So three plus two, five, and three minus two, one. Now we already have one, that's okay, right? It, it, we can generate all possible odd numbers using this rule. And if we duplicate our efforts, oh well. So using these two clauses, we'll identify nothing but odd numbers. Will there be odd numbers that we don't identify using these, the, you know, these two clauses? Let's get rid of those. We'll put in a final clause that says, nothing else is an odd number. Question two says, the set of all numbers that are divisible by five. So again, how do we make a recursive definition? We start off with our base clause. And the most obvious number that's divisible by five is five. You know, five times one is five. So I'll say that five it has this property. Five is divisible by five. Five is divisible by five there's my base clause. Really, when you multiply, all you're really saying is add that number to itself however many times that, that you just said, right? So five times two, I'm saying you have two fives, five plus five, 10. Five times three, all I'm saying is you have three fives, five plus five plus five. So really my recursive clause can look a lot like the one from number one. I can say if X is divisible by five, then x plus five and x minus five is also divisible by five. So let's plug in what we got in our base clause to this rule. And I say five is divisible by five. So five plus five, 10 is divisible by five. Five minus five, zero is divisible by five, right? Five times zero is zero. And using this rule applied over and over again, I can find out, you know, all those numbers divisible by five. I could throw in that final clause now, nothing else is divisible by five. Question number three says, the set of all words, by words they mean finite string of letters, so not necessarily letters put together that mean something in English, but just any string of letters that use only, but not necessarily both of, the letters A and B. All right, so our base clause here, remember all recursive definitions start with a base clause. Our base clause here is gonna have to be a little bit more complicated because A could be a word, but also just B by itself could also be a word. So my base clause will say that A and B are both words that have only A's and B. I can't, whatever that crazy thing, you know, that property that they were saying is. Now for my recursive clause. I wanna be able to start with either A or B and then add another A or B to it. And from whatever results from, from either one of those, I can add another A or B to it. So I started with an A, I can add an A, or a, it can be AA or AB. And then, you know, starting with AA, I could have AAA or AAB, whatever it is. My recursive clause is gonna say something like this. If X is one of those words we're interested in, then adding A or B to X is also a word. And now I wanna throw in my final clause, Nothing else is one of these words that we're interested in. Question four, the set containing all of Bob's ancestors. So, well, ancestors include, you know, your parents, your parents' parents, et cetera, et cetera. So I think for my base clause, I should say that Bob's parents are his ancestors. For my recursive clause, I'm gonna say this. If X is an ancestor of Bob, then X's parents are also ancestors of Bob. And this is interesting because you can use this rule a potentially num infinite number of times, and yet there aren't an infinite number of ancestors. But once we get to that first parent, right, then this rule just stops working, right? I, I look around for X's parents and X doesn't have parents. So even though it covers a potentially infinite number of uses, it doesn't have to result in an infinite number of things. This example is also interesting because of what's called the ancestral of a relation, or sometimes just an ancestral. I think I should explain this here because this is very important to mathematicians, sometimes to philosophers. For the rest of you logicians, this 
may seem like a lot. I don't know, I'll try not to make it too gruesome. Let's consider that is a parent of relation. Let's say Carl is Bob's dad. So Carl is a parent of Bob. He stands in that is a parent of relation to Bob. But what about Doug, Carl's dad? Well, Doug stands in the is a parent of relation to Carl. And Carl stands in that relation to Bob. But Doug doesn't stand in that is a parent of relation to Bob. He stands in that is a grandparent of relation to Bob. But then if you think about that, is a grandparent of, what does that really mean? Well, all it means is, is a parent of, a parent of. In other words, all it's really doing that is a grandparent of relation, all it's really doing is composing the is a parent of relation twice, right? You're putting them together two times. And if you think about great grandparent, it's really is a parent of, a parent of, a parent of, great great grandparents, you know, all the same, going all throughout all of his ancestors here, uh, really all they are is, is piling up this is a parent of relation. Now, when you compose a relation with itself, you call that powers of the relation. So the first power of the relation is when the, the thing just shows up once. You know, uh, what is it? Doug is a parent? No, Carl is a parent of Bob? I think Carl is a parent of Bob. Carl is a parent of Bob, power number one, first power. Doug is a parent of, a parent of Bob, power number two, second power. So on and so forth. Now, consider this word ancestor. What does that mean? Well, really, all the ancestors of Bob are all those people that stand in one of those powers, right? If we collected each person from each power, right? First power is a parent of. Second power is a parent of, a parent of. That set right there, the word ancestor really is something in that set. That's all that it means. Now, Think about that ancestor relation. Carl is Bob's ancestor, right? Because he's one of those, is a parent of, he's in there. Doug is Carl's ancestor. So that would make Doug Bob's ancestor as well. This is called a transitive relation, right? You may have heard this in, in math class. A is greater than B, B is greater than C. Therefore, A is greater than C. You have that nice line of a relation. So by, by compiling this set together, what we've done is made this relation all transitive, just transitive things. This is called the transitive closure of that relation. You know, it closes off this relation to anything that's not in that transitive relation. The transitive closure of a relation is what we call an ancestral. And of course, it's named after this example right here, the ancestor relation. So the ancestor relation is an example of an ancestral. So don't get those two confused. Okay, on to our last question, number five. The set of cackles, ha ha ha, ha 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 ha, etc. So I'm I'm guessing what our author here means is that three ha's constitutes a cackle, and anytime you add an additional ha, that also constitutes a cackle. I don't think that he means like just one ha would be a cackle or just two ha's. So we'll start off with our base clause being ha 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 is a cackle. Then we'll get our recursive clause. If X is a cackle, then adding a ha to X is also a cackle. And then our final clause, nothing else is a cackle. Although we could actually drop our final clause here because maybe a he 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 would also be a cackle. I don't know. So notice that we don't have to have our final clause necessarily. Also notice that we really could have started off our base clause with ha ha ha, ha 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 ha, ha 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 are all cackles if x is a, and then in our recursive clause if x is a cackle then adding ha to x is also a cackle right we only need one thing in that first set to in order to generate the rest of them but we but in that first set we can add as many as we really wanted to that's all we have for recursive definitions if you still have questions please let me know in the comments for next time please read 2.5.2 logical and non-logical vocabulary 2.5.3 constructing well form formulas which we've already done a little bit of practice with, but we're gonna see like a, a more um, orderly way of doing so. And finally do 2.5.3.1 exercises where you get some exercise in constructing those.